Okay, everyone, let's get on with part three of this lecture. So in part three, we're going to uh, look at ocean colour um, applications in the context of climate. So we will begin by just giving a bit of background uh, to this application of uh, the greenhouse effect. We're going to talk a little bit about essential climate variables. We're going to discuss the requirements of ocean colour data sets for climate change, which might be very different in some cases to re requirements for other applications, the need for long, stable ocean colour data records. And then we're going to think a little bit about the responses of the marine ecosystem, so particularly phytoplankton, to climate change, how um, various components of this ecosystem can change with climate, and we're going to finish by just touching on some other applications that I haven't had the chance to go into detail in this lecture, um, which is focused very much on the open ocean. OK, so the greenhouse effect. So we saw this schematic diagram a bit earlier on when we were talking about the ocean carbon cycle. Uh, at the atmospheric CO2 concentrations have been increasing. Um, and uh, as they increase, uh, they essentially trap outgoing uh, long wave radiation um, um, in our atmosphere, which heats the planet, known as this greenhouse effect. Now, to monitor the greenhouse effect and to monitor um, uh, its effect on the climate uh, and the planet, uh, in 1992, um, the Global Climate Observing System identified 50 essential climatic variables um, that they deemed um, we need to monitor in order to support the work of the Intergovernmental Expert Group on the Evolution of Climate, the UNFCCC and the IPCC. So an essential climatic variable is a physical, chemical or biological variable or a group of linked variables that critically contributes to the characterization of the Earth's climate. Now, um, in 2009, um, uh, launched, I think, in 2010, actually, uh, the European Space Agency introduced what they called the Climate Change Initiative. And of these um, uh, essential climatic variables that were identified by the uh, Global Observing uh, uh, Ocean, uh, uh, Climate Observing System, uh, a number of them could be targeted using satellite observations. And one of those was ocean colour. So it's established that the water leaving radiance or reflectance uh, as observed from satellites of the ocean, the ocean colour, and the chlorophyll A concentration, which we can der derive from satellite observations, are essential climate variables. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is now. OK, so why are phytoplankton um, a good uh, essential climatic variable, in a sense? Well, firstly, phytoplankton are at the... Um, core of um, the carbon cycle in the ocean and we learned a bit about that in the previous slides. So phytoplankton they're at the base of the food web, they photosynthesize, they modulate the CO2 concentrations in the ocean which influences the atmospheric CO2 concentrations um, and so ultimately they play a pivotal role in uh, modulating our climate. Now, phytoplankton, unlike, um, say, plants in the terrestrial world, have life cycles that are very short, in the order of weeks, uh, days and weeks, really. What this means is the phytoplankton can respond rapidly to changes in climate. Uh, they've once been referred to as the uh, canary in the coal mine. So if you don't know about canaries in the coal mines, well, miners used to take these little canary birds down into the mines and when the um, gases in the mines um, became toxic uh, the canaries would often would die before they've had an effect on the humans so if your canary died you'd get out of the mine as quick as possible and phytoplankton um, have been referred to as the equivalent for climate 
And these uh, diagrams just sort of illustrate that. So this is a time series of chlorophyll concentration in red from uh, OCCCI. So this is the Ocean Colour Climate Change Initiative. And it's overlaid on the um, a multivariate ENSO index at the top and the Indian Ocean Dipole at the bottom. So these are two climate, climate indices. Now these uh, time series data have been deseasonalized. And the IO uh, ocean, Indian Ocean Diapart at the bottom is a difference between chlorophyll in these, those two boxes, the deseasonalized chlorophyll trend in those two boxes. But what this image shows is how tightly coupled phytoplankton are to changes in their environment, and hence why they are an essential climate variable. OK, so if we want to monitor climate change using ocean coloured data, we um, need to consider the requirements in terms of the resolution, the accuracy and the stability in our ocean colour observations. What are the requirements to meet the demands of uh, looking at applications in climate? So within certainly the um, European Space Agency Ocean Colour Climate Change Initiative, the goal um, uh, following uh, uh, GCOS uh, requirements was to create the most complete, consistent, error-characterised time series of multi-sensor satellite products for climate research. So the multi-sensor is an important one because ocean colour sensors typically have lifespans of five to ten years. And so if we want to create a long term record of ocean colour, we need to stitch together the ocean colour observations from these different platforms to create that long term trend. And ideally we want our water leaving radiance data to be um, have an accuracy of 5% at blue to green wavelengths and our chlorophyll concentration 30%. And the stability of these um, products should be around 0.5% for water leaving radiance and 3% for chlorophyll. So this is a schematic diagram illustrating the processes conducted in the European Space Agency Ocean Colour Climate Change Initiative. So they take a series of satellite products from the European Space Agency MERIS satellite, NASA's CWIS, MODIS Aqua and VIRS, and a European Space Agency Sentinel-3. And um, they perform atmospheric correction on all of these data sets, selecting the best atmospheric algorithm uh, for each satellite uh, through a series of uh, intercomparison exercises. Now, because these satellites measure ocean colour at slightly different wavelengths, these uh, the data needs to be band shifted to a common set of wavelengths um, and bias corrected. So um, systematic differences between platforms need to be eliminated in order to create this stable long term record. And then finally, the data needs to be merged. Now, once we have the merged product, we then apply our ocean colour algorithms to derive chlorophyll, to derive our inherent optical properties. Um, uh, and these data, sets, these data sets are then produced together with careful uncertainty characterization using um, a large in situ database which should be matched up with the satellite observations to test their quality and determine their accuracy and their precision. And really one of the most important things to show is that this whole process is, is an iterative loop. So as and when better algorithms um, come along, they can be integrated into the data stream. And the current ocean colour satellite um, uh, a climate record for OCCI is over 20 years long now, providing products at daily, weekly, monthly and annual timescales. So this uh, image is just um, an example of merging uh, data from three different satellites here. So we have a daily image of Meris on the top left, then Modis Aqua in the middle and Cirrus on the right. These data are band shifted, bias corrected and then merged together and you can see the merged product at the bottom has much better spatial coverage than uh, each of the products individually shown at the top. Now based on our maps of our uncertainty uh, derived using optical classification methods, uh, if you want to learn a bit more about that the references are shown there. 
Uh, so every satellite observation at a pixel comes with a on estimate of uncertainty, root mean square difference and bias. And we can look at these uh, maps of uncertainty to determine whether these satellite products are meeting the GCOS requirements. And certainly um, uh, uh, results from the Ocean Colour Climate Change initi Initiative suggest they are for the majority of cases. And again, this image just illustrates how the coverage um, of a, uh, the Ocean Colour Climate Change Initiative product, shown in the bottom right here, um, is much better than many of these individual sensors. And this is particularly true for certain regions of the ocean, like the Red Sea um, and, the, uh, and the Gulf of Aden, um, that where traditionally it's been very hard to to collect ocean colour observations from satellite owing to the atmospheric complexities in this region. But with this new merge product, we can get much better coverage. And again, this plot just illustrates the uh, coverage in daily coverage in percentage of these different platforms used in the merge product. The two NASA satellites at the top here, the European Space Agency Meris sensor sensor in the bottom left here, processed with the polymer atmospheric correction algorithm, and consequently the merged ocean colour product at the bottom with much higher uh, daily coverage in the order of 50% over many regions of the ocean. Okay, so we, we can create this long-term ocean colour data record to look at climate change and climate change processes. But then we need to think a little bit about what are the responses of the marine ecosystem to a changing climate? What might we expect to see as our oceans become warmer, as they become more acidic? So firstly, the total amount of phytoplankton might change. So the biomass of phytoplankton in the ocean might change. Now, it could be that the biomass in the ocean doesn't change. However, the community structure of the phytoplankton changes. And as we learned earlier, the size of the phytoplankton is very important. Now, if we see shifts in the size of the phytoplankton, that could have implications for ocean carbon cycling processes like export production, like sinking rate. The physiology of the phytoplankton might change. So um, the the photosynthetic rates, for instance. The phenology of the phytoplankton might change. So it's something we haven't touched on yet, but the phenology describes the seasonal uh, cycles of phytoplankton in the ocean. So when the phytoplankton bloom starts, how long it, it lasts and um, when it peaks. Now, these timings of events are very important uh, in the context of... Um, how energy flows up through the food web. For instance, if the phytoplankton bloom just before or a bit earlier than, than, the, um, than um, the spawning of fish larvae, for instance, that, could, that provides the initial food that the fish larvae need to grow. If the phytoplankton bloom is a lot later, um, maybe the food sources isn't available for when this um, fish spawn. So the phenology is a very important characteristic. The geographical distribution of phytoplankton might change and also the vertical distribution. So this is an important thing to note with satellite observations. Remembering again, we only see the surface ocean. What's happening down at depth is hard to see from space and we need additional observations uh, to understand how they, those components might be changing. OK, so in terms of total biomass, now there was this um, high profile paper published in 2010 stating that global phytoplankton biomass was declining over the past 100 years. And this was based on a compilation of in situ observations, including Secchi depth, uh, uh, Secchi depth uh, data going back to the early um, uh, 20th century. Now, following the publication of this paper, there were a series of comments questioning uh, in, gen in general, the results from the study, and it promoted additional work. And the authors of their original article went on to publish two more papers in Limnology and Oceanography and in Progress in Oceanography, where they revisited a lot of these trends, uh, with the general consensus uh, uh, showing that their original results held, albeit with some minor modifications. 
However, all of these uh, findings are based on in situ observations. <coughs> Excuse me. And a comment on uh, this article um, uh, in this version of Nature. So that's that 2010 article published by David Siegel and Brian Franz stated that the analysis of Boisatel document the historical record. However, looking into the future, satellite observations will be the main source of data for assessing change in the pelagic ecosystem. So emphasising that, OK, that's what's happened in the past. But going forward, satellites are the key to monitoring changes in phytoplankton biomass. So what have satellites showed? Well, some work back in the early um, 2020s, sorry, 20, uh, 2000s, 2002, and then another paper I'll talk about in a minute in 2005, looked, uh, compared the chlorophyll biomass record from the, the coastal zone colour scanner, so that first proof of concept NASA mission, uh, and uh, the CWIFS uh, data record over a period of um, over 20 years and found that the global spatial distributions and seasonal variability of ocean chlorophyll were similar over these periods, but global means decreased over the two observational segments. Now, one of the real difficulties with these two satellite data records is they didn't overlap, so it's very hard to intercalibrate them. And this was sort of demonstrated by another study which analysed these two satellite data records independently uh, using a different atmospheric correction algorithm and actually showed an overall increase in the world average chlorophyll concentration by about 22%, mainly due to large increases in the intertropical areas. So it just shows how that two different analysis, analyses of the same data set showed two contrasting results. Now, work that followed on um, from that um, Antoine paper in 2005 uh, showed uh, with real confidence how multi-decadal changes in global phytoplankton abundances are related to basin scale oscillations in the physical ocean. So changes in the Atlantic meridional um, oscillation, uh, changes in the North Atlantic oscillation, changes in the Pacific decadal oscillation have profound impact 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 on phytoplankton biomass now in another study uh, which i thought was very elegant actually um, they used the continuous plankton recorder so this was if you recall in the first part of our, our, our lecture this device that's towed on the ships of opportunity and and it is used to look at the color using this phytoplankton colour index. They intercalibrated or bridged the two satellite records, CZCS and CWIFS, using the CPR data. Now, this was focused mainly in the northeast Atlantic, so only a small part of the ocean, or the world's ocean. But they showed that in, in their case, the chlorophyll had increased considerably uh, uh, between the CZCS era and the CWIFS era. Now, in terms of the CCI record, we have, as I say, over 20 years of uh, satellite observations. And this is our current picture of uh, global trends in chlorophyll. So we can see that in, in certain regions of the oceans, we appear to be seeing an increase in global chlorophyll concentrations. Certainly in the polar regions or high latitude regions, there seems to be generally increases in chlorophyll consistent with um, more sea ice, more sea ice melting in, around Antarctica for instance however there are areas in the tropical um, uh, oceans that are declining like in the Indian Ocean in, in the equatorial Pacific however one one point that we really need to hammer home with this is the difference between climate variability and climate change Okay, so climate variability is defined as short term rises and falls around this, the mean state of the climate. Whereas climate change, really, we're looking at long term multi decadal to century scale persistent rises or falls in either the mean state of the climate or its variability for an extended period. Now, a seminal paper was published back in 2010 by Stephanie Henson and colleagues, where they demonstrated that in order to look at climate change using the ocean colour record, we need around 40 years of data. So we're not there yet with um, uh, really being able to 
use the uh, ocean color ocean color record to look at climate change at least from the period of the late 90s to to present where we have this uh, overlapping record of ocean color observations okay so another thing that can change um uh, in the oceans that we could look to detect from space is changes in um phytoplankton community structure okay so these images uh, are plots on the left show the fraction of small cells to total biomass. So these are the picophytoplankton in the ocean in all three plots that's shown on the y axis as a function of the total biomass, the total chlorophyll concentration on the x axis. And what these uh, interesting studies showed is that for the same chlorophyll concentration, we can see shifts in the size structure of the phytoplankton caused by um, variations in the environment, either the sea surface temperature shown in the two studies on the left or the left study in the middle study, or in the light environment as shown on the right. So this really um, uh, waves a flag um, in the sense that we need to develop ocean colour algorithms that can detect independently the chlorophyll concentration and the community structure of the phytoplankton if we are to understand if a change in ocean colour has been caused by a change in biomass or a change in community structure. Now, as discussed before, the phytoplankton phenology can change. So uh, these are the uh, uh, basically metrics quantifying the seasonality of the phytoplankton, the initiation of the phytoplankton bloom, the duration and the amplitude. And as I mentioned before, the timings of these events are critical uh, for um, the survival of higher trophic levels. It, and in, in some very nice papers published in, 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 Na in Nature and Science showed how interannual variations in the timing of the spring bloom can impact the survival of larval fish. This is just a nice paper from uh, Marie-Fanny Racol, who was also a European Space Agency postdoctoral fellow who looked at trends in the anomalies of duration uh, in the world's ocean and found at the time similar patterns that they see with the total chlorophyll concentration. The other thing that can change, and then going back to this nice paper by Dionysus Reitzos in 2013, where they studied um, uh, the CPR data from the northeast Atlantic with the two satellite missions, CRIFS and CZCS, and they showed that um, the environment had shifted from a um, too blooming um, seasonality where you have a, a strong spring, spring bloom and then um, a decline in the phytoplankton biomass over the summer and then an autumnal bloom as the storms come in and mix up the oceans. And it's moved away from this two, two peak uh, um, a seasonality into just one peak seasonality in more recent years. So not only can the the metrics change themselves, but also the um, nature of the phenological uh, cycle might be changing. And this is something we can monitor from space. Now in polar regions, th these are some of the regions that are cha changing most dramatically with climate change. More um, Ice is melting, there's more open ocean certainly in the Arctic over the past sort of 20 years. And what scientists have been showing is that this has also been changing the phenology of the phytoplankton. So in this study they showed that um, a phenology of biological productivity with two phytoplankton blooms and two peaks of sedimentation became more prevalent actually in Arctic regions um, uh, uh, as we've in more recent years. And there are also a, a whole other ranges, range of responses uh, that we need to consider. Some uh, nice work looking at biogeochemical province regions, work showing how initially uh, oligotrophic regions may be expanding, shown on the left there. Uh, some regions started to expand but then stopped, such as the South Pacific, um, shown in the bottom figure, figure there, really showing how interannual or climate variability has a very strong influence on fluctuations in these um, uh, oligotrophic regions. 
And as we discuss the vertical structure of phytoplankton might change, and that's where we really need to have some additional uh, platforms that can look at the vertical composition and, and, and link them to the satellite, like these biogeochemical Argo floats we've talked about in part two. And the other thing to consider as well is, is it's very much focused on the marine ecosystem, uh, this, this part of the lecture, but there are other com, uh, com, other water constituents that might change. So for instance, the amount of sedum in the water could change in a future climate. You know, if UV light levels change, for instance, and that could impact how um, the algorithms we use on our satellite uh, uh, remote sensing reflectance data sets. So we really need to monitor those too. And there's a very nice paper published by Shubhasathi and Dranath in 2017 in Remote Sensing of Environment that discusses all these factors and uh, makes recommendations for appropriate algorithms to use on our ocean colour record for detecting these climate uh, 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 change responses. Now, in this lecture, I've my main applications I focused on are the ocean carbon cycle and climate. And these are really sort of a large scale um, global um, applications. But there are a whole range of other applications for ocean colour data. Ocean colour data has had some has shown real use in um, in fishery studies, in fisheries management studies in monitoring water quality, particularly in lake, nearshore and estuarine environments. Ocean colour observations are, are used to study harmful algal blooms. They've been used for aquaculture um, monitoring and uh, um, management. Uh, they're currently used a lot for tracking marine pollution. Um, and, and, and increasingly in the last few years, um, uh, floating plastic debris. They're used also to look at biofeedback mechanisms. So in this climate part of the lecture, I focus very much on um, on the ocean and not so much on the coupling between the ocean and other components um, in the uh, on Earth. For instance, phytoplankton can have been known to release um, cloud condensate cloud condensation nuclei and thereby influencing the cloud properties. Phyto a lot of the heat absorbed by phytoplankton also, sorry, a lot of the light absorbed by phyto phytoplankton is also converted to heat and that can influence um, bio biofeedback mechanisms related to uh, heat exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. And of course, ocean colour it's also used for marine biodiversity and function, building on some of those phytoplankton functional type and phytoplankton size class products we discussed. Now, if you want to learn more about this, I strongly recognize, I strongly recommend you go onto the IOCCG website. So this is the International um, Ocean Color Coordinating Group website, and they have a whole suite of ocean color uh, reports focusing on different applications for ocean colour data, some of which are listed on the left here, others which I've discussed during this lecture. There's also a very nice paper by Steve Groom published uh, recently in Frontiers and Marine Science at the bottom, which gives our current status and future perspective of satellite ocean colour remote sensing. Thank you very much for listening. I really hope you've enjoyed this lecture or this these three parts to this lecture. Thank you.